in our last session, we talked about the first five sutras. These five sutras are the most important sutras in this text. Because they are so important, I would like to summarize them and go into a little bit more detail. As you may recall, the very first sutra was Yoga Anushasanam. Her Yoga Anushasanam, that means now the study of yoga begins. There have been many commentaries written, some of them very complicated and difficult, but one of the very first commentaries to be written on the Yoga Sutras is called Vyas Bhashyam. It is credited to the sage Vyas, the authorship, and it is also a very ancient text, and it has some interesting insights which help us understand the sutras. The sutras being so short, sometimes are very uh, confusing and very difficult to grasp. So the Vyas Bhashram gives us some good hints. To this very first sutra, the Bhashyam explains that there are five kinds of minds. The very first mind, type of mind, is called Shipta. That is a very restless mind. To understand this, I will take a very extreme example. Imagine a person who is mentally sick and this person's reacting violently to anything that comes in front of him or her. So whatever comes in front of that screen on the mind, the manas is responding or reacting without any coordination of the four instruments of the mind, that is, the antakarna. Now, this is an extreme situation. I have brought up this situation only to explain the, how this mind would look. So, if you have manas, which coordinates the senses and the cognitive as well as active, it is always looking for instructions from buddhi because buddhi is the inner wisdom that decides, judges and discriminates. And the karna, on the other hand, has taken over this role from buddhi and has created this separation from the whole, given you a sense of identity. Chitta is the store bank the memories are stored in here. So, a shipped person, a person with a shipped mind, is very focused on manas. And this manas does not really cooperate with buddhi, nor does it cooperate with ahankara. Things bubble out of chitta, and manas just reacts to the things which bubble out of chitta or to anything that is in the external world. So you can well imagine that this kind of mind is kind of irrational. The next kind of mind, as explained by the Vasyam, is Muda. Muda is stupefied, dull, tamasic. Such a person is is doesn't really grasp things, doesn't understand. So the buddhi is very dull. There is a lot of heaviness or heavy samskaras in chitta. 
Ahankara is not well developed. Manas does not cooperate. So here the mind is perhaps a little bit better, but very stupefied, very dull. The vikship, the mind, is more or less the normal kind of mind that we know of. You'd say it is normally abnormal. It is distracted. Here too, Manas is not necessarily well trained, but it is still occasionally following the instructions of Buddhi or Ahankara. It is able to control, Ahankara is able to control the memory bank, what is bubbling out of there. So such a person would not react instantaneously to something which happens either in the external world or in the internal world. He is able to control himself and use his, exercise his buddhi and act accordingly, but in a distracted manner, which means sometimes it happens, sometimes it does not happen. Such a person may shift occasionally into muda, the stupefied phase as well. Next comes a mind set, which is very important for us to understand. And that is called the Ekagra mind. Most of us may have heard of this. Ekagra means one pointed. And the Ekagra mind is one where all these four aspects of the mind are coordinated. So you see these four, they are inner instruments of the mind. And they are well coordinated when we have a Ekagra mind, which means that all the senses, cognitive as well as active senses, are well trained and they obey manas, which is in turn following the guidance of buddhi. Ankara is well polished and is very useful to interact with the external world. And Chitta, the memory bank, whatever is coming out of this or whatever is going into it is well managed. So all these are well trained. Such a mind is called Ekagra mind. Generally, we have this concept that Ekagra means somebody who is able to push away everything and concentrate on a object of meditation. Or you think of somebody as one-pointed if he is so absorbed in his work or reading a book or creating something and we consider such a person to be one-pointed. Or if a person is very clear about his goals in life, what he wants to do, he is very decisive, you see he's one-pointed. The yogic understanding, especially from meditative tradition, is that a one-pointed mind is coordinated. So if you have a goal, all four aspects are together working to fulfill that wish or desire. So if your goal is to attend this meeting, you make it happen. How do you make it happen? Some part of you decided you wanted to go for this meeting. You may have had other engagements, but all the same, your inner wisdom said, this is important. Ahankara, the eye maker, created an identity saying, I am a sincere student. 
I need to know these things. In the memory bank, there were positive memories of other such meetings and you enjoyed learning, you were growing. And so these positive memories also contributed to that decision, made it stronger. And therefore, Manas also followed this guidance and there you are, you are in this meeting. So that's an agagramite. The last form that the sage Vyas tells us about is Nirodha. Nirodha is that state of mind where all the vrittis, and vrittis you may recall are all thoughts, emotions, desires, and images in the mind. When all these vrittis subside, the mind is in a state of nirodha. So this is the explanation of the five kinds of minds, five different kinds of minds. It is a good idea to reflect on this and sometimes observe that you may be feeling restless, you're just reacting to things in the external world, you get upset about something, then you're being in, in a, you have a, a shipped mind at that point of time. At times you may feel very dull, thamasic, almost depressed, sad. And those moments, you have a mood of mind. Most other times, you have a vikshipta mind, which is distracted. It's following different objects, it's going from one thing to another. Under rare circumstances, you may observe that you are very ekagra, very one-pointed about certain things. You were all very one-pointed about attending this meeting. That's why you all are here. So, observing the nature of your mind, the kind of mind you have is very useful. You understand where you are and where you want to go. It's important to know where you are if you have a certain goal in mind. If you don't know where you are and you overestimate yourself and you have this idea, a fixed idea that you have a Kagra mind, then it's not possible for the teacher to guide you or help you because you have this fixed idea and you're not willing to see the reality of that. So an honest self-assessment is very useful here and you can do this in your on the weekend perhaps, observe yourself and see at times you're just reacting out of manas, when you're feeling dull, when you're distracted, and when you are one-pointed. So most of us go through these different phases. There are very few people who are just in one category. Those who are completely shipta or restless are then seriously uh, ill. They have a serious mental illness. Same with those who are only in the category of muda. So the average person is generally vikshipta. 
and it's only a rare one who is a kagra with a great deal of practice systematic practice removing conflicts which are in the mind internal conflicts the mind becomes ekagra and the ekagra mind is ready and fit for higher meditation so the most basic aspect is the preparation of yoga refers to the earlier three kinds of mind the, the first three forms of mind the ekagra mind is able to attain self realization kaivalya while the other three kinds of minds need to be trained any question so far regarding the internal functions or the five kinds of minds Okay. In that case, we will continue. As I mentioned, the first five sutras are extremely important. So, I will briefly summarize the verses two, three, and four, which really defines yoga. Especially two and three, they, there's a definition of yoga, which says that when all the vrittis subside that state of nirodha is called yoga the vrittis are all thoughts mental images emotions and desires all that is in the mind the mind stuff these vrittis subside during deeper practices of meditation and when that happens that's the state of nirodha so when the mind is stilled the lake of the mind is still you can see through and when this occurs pure consciousness shines forth and you know you are one with the infinite whole you are a wave of bliss and beauty in the vast ocean of consciousness so this is what yoga is how it is defined at all other times you always identifying with your thoughts or the mental images or the emotions or the desires forgetting that you are pure consciousness you can understand this better here that this diagram that is so very useful you see the center of consciousness and that is what you are but most of the time you think you are either the senses of the body or you get attached or identified with some of the thoughts in the conscious mind all that which is in the active and latent unconscious you are not aware of you are have no access to it so you don't really identify with that but these patterns in the active and latent unconscious mind influence the conscious mind and you get attached to these habit patterns they are also known as ahankara in the habit patterns they they form 
little identities. There could be many different identities. Each of us has different identities. The same person is a daughter or a son. You could also have the role of a mother or father. You could be somebody's brother or sister. You are someone's spouse, husband or wife. So you have different roles and in these you have different habit patterns. So you get so attached to those different patterns of, of behavior that you forget that you are in fact the eternal Atman. So this is what the Yoga Sutra is saying. Anybody has questions about this so far or any thoughts you want to share? Okay, in that case we go to one of the most important verses and that is verse 5. Verse 5 is really the crux of meditation. And that's what we want to do. We want to uncolor these thoughts. We've got identified with these thoughts and now we want to uncolor them. First of all, we have to understand what is this? What are these colored and uncolored thoughts? So, all the vrittis or the ripples on their mind fall into five categories. Most of which are klishta or colored and the rest are not colored. So before we go into the five categories, first we must understand what klishta and eklishta means. Klishta is colored, eklishta is not colored. Colored thoughts, mental images, emotions, desires are those which lead us to a false belief. They mis cause us to mistake misery for happiness. They cause us to regard our body and mind as our true nature. And uncolored or not colored thoughts are those that lead away from this false belief system and promote the direct experience of our true nature. In the last session, I gave an example that... If your child is late coming home from school or from wherever, you start getting worried. The child is really very late, has not called you, not informed you. You try to reach your child, but you can't get through. You start panicking. That is a klishta. These are klishta thoughts, this worry, this, this, these fears, this imagination. All this is klishta, it's colored. Why is it colored? Because that's my child. You identified with the child. If the same thing happened to your neighbor's child, neighbor's child is missing, it's not come home, it's very late, you certainly will empathize with your neighbor, you will offer your help and assistance, but you will not panic. Why not? Because it is not my child. That small word, my, makes all the difference. That is the identification. And identification means color. That means it is klishta thought. The 
whole purpose of all our meditation practices is to make these colored thoughts into not colored thoughts. So what happens to your child? It doesn't mean that you don't love your child anymore or don't care for your child anymore. You do. In fact, you are probably even a better parent when you are able to uncolor your attachment to your child because then you will see what is really important and good for the child and not let your emotions influence all your decisions. So it's an important distinction. It's not easy to understand, but it's an important distinction that attachment or identification is not necessarily love. Attachment or identification will lead us to be unhappy, especially when that child grows up and goes away. And this we experience in many aspects of our life. Attachment to our job, attachment to our house, attachment to our relatives, to many different ideas that we have about ourselves. These are all identifications. And these are all colored thoughts. And the entire process of med meditation is about uncoloring the thoughts. We also say that is purification. It's another word for uncoloring. Shivuas is klishta, the same as avidya. Avidya is a larger term. It has a larger meaning. But yes, in a sense, avidya is caused by our klishta thoughts, by our vrittis that are klishta in nature. Yes, to help you understand this, the different vrittis and the process, that's a very important aspect of meditation, of which I have this very interesting diagram. You see, the surface, we have actions and speech. That's the most surface level that we have in us, in our minds. Deeper than actions and speech are thoughts. Still deeper are emotions. Still deeper are the samskaras. These are the impressions, raw impressions in the mind. And finally, there are the four primitive fountains. These are basically forms of vasanas. So, Imagine you're walking down <clears throat> a street and you see a new cafe, a new restaurant, a new cafe, and they have some lovely ice cream there. Wonderful mango ice cream, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and you say, oh, my favorite strawberry ice cream, and you decide to try it out. That's action. You try out the ice cream, it was really very good, so... You have a good experience, a good memory of it. Where does it go? It goes right here. So thought was, hmm, good ice cream. Emotion, 
good, you know, you developed a certain liking for it, it's pleasurable, so you get attached to the idea of having more ice cream. And this is stored in your samskaras down here. That wonderful ice cream. A few days later, you're walking down the street again. Now, what happens? That thought which you put down there now gets active again because you saw the cafe again or the ice cream again. So this samskara here, down here, gets active again and comes an emotion or a memory of that good experience and the desire develops to have more ice cream. So the thought is, hmm, maybe I should get another ice cream, which plays out into you going and asking somebody there, please give me another of these strawberry ice creams. So you see how that worked. Two-way process. We take things from the external world, they go inside, but then they come up again. And that's how a simple thing like strawberry ice cream is now a klishta thought. You will not be able to pass by that cafe without thinking about ice cream and thinking about that good experience. So you see how many things were involved in that. Manas was involved, went there to the cafe, asked for ice cream. Ankara registered it and said, hmm, maybe this is a nice cafe. I'm going to remember this again. Come back here another time. Memories were stored in Chitta. Memories bubbled up. Buddhi had to take a decision, but maybe the Buddhi was not so sharp and decided to have another ice cream, even though maybe you just had eaten and were really quite full. So you went ahead, Manas ignored Buddhi and went ahead and got himself or herself another ice cream. That is the nature of our traditional thoughts. And we are going through this process all the time. So now the entire process, Shibu, is called Avidya. Because that created more desires. And that keeps coming again. So the whole thing, a simple thing, has now become an entire process leading us into this again and again. So remember we said that colored thoughts are those that make us believe that certain things will give us happiness or regards the body and the mind as your true nature. It takes you further away from pure consciousness. So you strengthen this entire process, the cycle of strengthening the samskaras comes out in the world as karma, and the karma again strengthens the, uh, the samskaras. So this is, this is avidya. This is the entire process, which is called avidya. Sri Ram asks, how do we uncolor our thoughts? And how do we recognize that our thoughts are colored? Well, for the second part of the question, how do we recognize our thoughts are colored? Yes, that's the entire process of meditation. How do we uncolor also the process of meditation? We will go deeper into that question just now because we will be studying in verses 6 to 11 the different kinds of thoughts and how we deal with them. So that is, that is an important part of meditation, how we turn klishta thoughts into klishta thoughts. For this, we need to study the mind. Studying the Yoga Sutras is useful only if you're also studying the mind. If you are not studying the mind through meditation, then it is purely an intellectual exercise. Think of your laptop or your computer and 
you want to learn how to use a certain program. Maybe you've just got a new uh, laptop and you have a great program on it, perhaps something like spreadsheets, you know, Excel or so. It's a little bit more complicated and you want to learn how to use it. And you just keep reading the manual, but you don't actually use, use the program. That's kind of pretty useless. So you need to use the program, which is exactly what Yoga Sutras is about. All these ideas are going to be purely intellectual and very difficult to follow if you do not meditate. You need to understand these in the context of meditation. So, verse 6 tells us that there are five kinds of vrittis or ripples in the mind. This verse merely enumerates these five kind of, of um, vrittis and the following sutras go into it. So I'm just going to read them. The first one is called Praman, which is correct cognition. The second one is incorrect cog cog cognition, which is called Vipariyaya. The third is imagination or Vikalp. The fourth is Nidra, deep dreamless sleep. And the fifth is Smriti or memory. So these are the five kinds of thoughts. All the thoughts in your mind are of these five kinds. Apart from being klishta, most of them are klishta, apart from being klishta, they can be categorized into one of these five categories. So the very first one is correct cognition and verse 7 describes that in a little bit more detail. So correct cognition in turn is of three kinds. So correct cognition is when you see things the way they are. So direct perception, you see something and you know what it is immediately. That is direct perception. So imagine there's a very big knife and you look at it and immediately you see the knife and you say, hey, that's a very sharp and a very dangerous knife. Be careful. Don't play around with it. You'll get hurt. So that's direct perception. The second is inference. That's knowing a thing through a thought process. You look at the shape, the size, and you judge what it is like such as in house, from the shadow you will see how it looks and you decide how the shape is of the house. You have decided from its shadow that it's a sharp knife. Sorry, uh, that's a house. But what about the knife? If you use this example, you see somebody has cut himself. You will infer from this, oh, that knife must have been very sharp. Look how badly you cut yourself. So that was an inference. You didn't see the knife. You didn't know anything about this knife. But because you saw a terrible cut, somebody cut himself, you, you inferred from that that this is a dangerous knife. Third, is testimony. Testimony is knowing something through an external authority, such as a teacher. And the teacher or the other person, the external authority, has the direct perception or knows through correct inference. Let's go back to our knife example. What happens when you've not really looked at the knife carefully, you don't know what it is like and you were just about to hold it and somebody, the person who was cut by this knife said, 
Hey, stop. Be careful. This is a very dangerous knife. You can cut yourself. This person has had the direct experience, the per direct perception of how sharp the knife was. So he is now an authority. And you take his testimony if you trust him, believe him. And if you don't trust him, believe him, and you insist on trying it out for yourself, the result is you will cut yourself. Now, this is what happens very often in yoga. And in yoga, when you go through the practice, you see certain objects, you perceive them directly. You perceive them directly through buddhi. So, Stuart, to, to refer to your question, are we using buddhi to uncolor thoughts? Yes. Buddhi leads to correct cognition. So buddhi is very important for meditation. So that we see all the things which are floating in our mind, in our thoughts during meditation. We can look at these vrittis and see them for what they are. Very often what happens is that students, they don't practice, so they like to read. So they go to the third point, that is testimony. So they believe the testimony of the scriptures or the teacher, but they don't have direct perception. They have not practiced. So they may believe or not believe. And that's why you may accept a testimony of teachers or scriptures, but it's important finally to have the direct perception. Inference is very useful as well. Inference saves you a lot of trouble, saves you from getting into deeper trouble and creating more aklishta thoughts. Sorry, more Krishna thoughts. So, correct cognition is what we all want to have. And that's why we use buddhi to uncolor our thoughts. We want to learn how to bring that, sharpen that buddhi. Buddhi is sharpened through the process of meditation when you keep looking at things and you keep removing conflicts. Just want to shortly go back to this diagram. And we see that because of all four of these, there are a lot of activity in the mind. There are a lot of Klishta thoughts. So the pool of the mind is full of ripples, full of vrittis. Because manas is active, it's doing its own thing. There are a lot of little, little identities which are dragging you in different directions. You're identified to your role maybe as a, a father and you want to spend time with your ch children. But you may be also identified with your role as an important manager and you don't have time. So this identity pulls you in different directions and the attachment as well as these emotions, these conflicts, don't allow you to see your thoughts clearly. You don't understand, Buddhi doesn't see clearly what is important. Chitta keeps throwing up different memories. So you're not able to see clearly. So the process of sharpening buddhi is actually a process of purification. You use buddhi as an instrument to make the thoughts eklishta. The more eklishta thoughts you have, the sharper your buddhi gets. So you can see that it's again a bit cyclical and at some point of time you just have to do it. You just have to get in there and do it and watch 
the vrittis of the mind and then it happens. It just happens that buddhi suddenly gets sharper and clearer, maybe just for a brief moment, but in that moment you are able to see things clearly. So, question from Stuart, when we notice colored thoughts, do we try to change them or just noticing them uh, begins to uncolor them? Yes, that's exactly right. We, we will discuss that in verse 8 because that is incorrect cognition. So, that's, thank you Stuart, we are going now to verse 8. And verse 8 says, Incorrect cognition is false knowledge, not recognizing and not knowing a thing as it is. So maybe you have a thought about your child who is now growing up as a teenager, but in your mind you have a picture of this child still as, not as a teenager, but as a little child. You know, so that's false knowledge because now you're behaving with your teenage son or daughter as though he were a kid. What's going to happen? Conflict with the teenager. Teenagers want more independence and you're trying to keep them kids and small and children just because you have an emotional attachment to that. So that is wrong cognition. We see that very often in um, fears that we have in meditation. We may have a fear about something and it is not rooted in any reality. It's just one of the various paranoid fears that we all have. For example, spiders. A lot of people are scared of spiders or bees or, or other creepy crawly insects. And most of these insects are actually harmless but still we are afraid of them. And so when these thoughts come in the mind, we start feeling fear, fear arises. This is incorrect cognition. What do you do with that fear? Nothing, you just watch it and it goes away. Sooner or later it will go away. That is the process in meditation where we say the classical example given is that of a rope in the dark. We mistake the rope in the dark to be a snake. The moment you turn on the light, you see it was only a rope and you start laughing about it. That was funny. It's the same with the spider or the bee or the insect, whatever it was. When that little fear comes up and you start looking at it and you say, hey, that was, that's just such a small little thing. And you may just start laughing about it. So that is the process of taking an incorrect cognition by observing, merely observing, allowing it to uncolor. We see this often with our relationships. You may have a person that's, I don't know, trying to, to convince you to do something. And you think that person is your friend and you take the advice. But you find out later that that person was not your friend, but your enemy. And he did not have your good intentions at heart. Sorry, he did not have good intentions at heart and your welfare at heart. And so he was your enemy. What happened? You did not recognize that person for what he was. That is also incorrect cognition. So what we want to do, the purpose of meditation is to turn incorrect cognition into correct cognition. 
And very often in the beginning, it's very useful to have testimony. Testimony is guidance from an external authority. So if you are not that strong and clear and focused yourself, it is useful to have a teacher who helps you initially. When we talked about this process, I said, it's almost cyclical. You need a sharp buddhi to uncolor your thoughts. But because there are so many, uncolor, so many colored thoughts, it's difficult to have a sharp buddhi. So how do we break that cycle? And so we need a break. One of the ways to do that is to get help from an external authority, from a teacher, from a teacher of a meditative tradition. It's customary to do this in almost every other area. And there we don't seem to have a problem with it. If you want to be good in your field, if you are into computers, you go and learn this from somebody who is an expert. If you want to be good at math, you go learn math from good math teachers. But yet a lot of people have an issue in yoga or in meditation to go to a teacher. They're afraid of gurus or teachers because they feel that they're giving away their independence or that these gurus or teachers have some ulterior motives. So we prefer to read books and to read websites and to do our own research and experimentation. And that keeps us stuck there for years, even decades, because you have not had some guidance in the initial stage so that you get the experience of direct perception and you learn to also infer when you've got, you've done the experiments, you've had the experiences. Some of the experiences may be negative, not very good experiences. For instance, I mentioned that if there is a sharp knife and you hurt yourself, then it's possible that that you would guide others and say, hey, don't, don't play with this knife. You've had also a bad experience. But that knife can also be useful. For surgery, it's very useful. It's very useful for, for defending yourself. It's very useful for something as simple as cutting vegetables. So you can, when you've experimented with something, you can also help others. So that is the process of meditation where you may initially use guidance or testimony so that eventually you have direct perception and inference by experimenting. That's how we try to acquire correct cognition. Any questions so far? Did I miss anything there? Okay. Verse 9 is talking about imagination. Imagination or vikalp can be very useful. It includes abstraction, like words like truth, freedom, wisdom. They have no concrete reality, but they're very useful. So, imagination as well. In our world, when we imagine things, we are creative. Dreaming, the active latent, uh, sorry, the active unconscious mind, dreaming state is also imagination. 
It's all in the mind. It's created. So certain concepts, thoughts and ideas are very useful because whenever we want to do something, we always imagine it first. Some of you want to learn meditation. You want to be very good at it. So you have first had an imagination in your mind, an idea in your mind, which was an abstract idea. It was only then that you started actively to look for information on it, actively decided to attend meetings, meet people, seek out teachers. That is because at first you had something in your imagination. It was a vague, diffuse idea. That was a very useful idea. And that led to whatever it is that you're doing. Everything in this world was at first an idea. If you look around you, chairs, somebody's idea. Tables was also somebody's idea. The bulb was a great idea, a great invention. But long before Edison had that idea, in form, it was in his mind. So extremely useful imagination. And that is called Vikalp. Verse 10 is deep, dreamless sleep, nidra. That is a contentless state. There's no content. There's no, there are no vrittis here. It's a state without vrittis. So here we go to our nice diagram here. And we see there that <clears throat> the unconscious mind here, the active unconscious mind, that first part, that's the kalp, that's imagination. And the second part, that is the latent unconscious mind, that's deep, dreamless state. So all these are part of the, the vrittis, right? This is the analysis. So here we have correct and incorrect cognition at the conscious level. At the unconscious level, you have dreaming or imagination. At the latent unconscious level, you have deep, dreamless state. And so you see that very clearly in this diagram. The very last Vritti is Smruti, that is memory, and that is also here. That is actually a more general word, and that's also Chitta. These memories are stored here in the unconscious mind. They are a special sort of um, Vritti. They surface from the latent unconscious mind. And then they surface up, they are called Vrittis. Then they are latent, they are still in Nidra, they are sleeping. Any questions so far? So as you can see, um, we have done a lot today, um, especially about the different kinds of vrittis. You can see that the Yoga Sutras are very dense, very packed, and it's an amazing study of the mind and of our thoughts and our ideas. And it's useful only to those who meditate. If you do not meditate, then it is not really very useful.
um, Yeshibu, you've just given us the Sanskrit words, and that's fine. So, I think we end over here. We will continue the session next Friday, as usual, the same time. I just wanted to see if anybody has any difficulties about the Yoga Sutras or any other questions. You can also post these questions on the that first uh, satsang group in on Facebook, if you like. Right? Okay. Thank you all. And bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye. Bye bye.